You're watching World Inside coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. Now we step back into history with the release of a new documentary about the late Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping's visit to the United States back in the year 1979. The film hit Chinese theaters last Friday. The movie has a number of surprises. It is the very first time animated images of the late Chinese leader have ever appeared on the silver screen. And it also goes into unprecedented details on an even assassination attempt during the historic visit. A moment in history. Deng Xiaoping's famous visit to the U.S. is retold on the big screen. And this film promises to shed new light on the trip, including meetings with American politicians, TV interviews, and even footage of two assassination attempts on Deng. What really happened during those nine days, and in particular, what kind of danger was Deng Xiaoping facing? My job is putting these stories onto the silver screen and letting more people know about those nine breathtaking days. It was an incredibly busy trip for Deng. Over the course of nine days, he attended over 80 major events, including 20 banquets and 10 press conferences. He might even have taken on too much, as he fell ill with a low fever towards the end of the visit. To give audiences a better idea of how Deng's visit played out, the documentary was shot following the same route he took back in 1979. It's also caught notice by depicting the former leader in animation for the first time. Along with the cartoons, the film weaves together historical footage and interviews to bring the period to life. What impressed me the most was the use of animation in the film. Deng Xiaoping was short, plump and genial. After watching the animation, we smiled and we were convinced by Deng's brilliant political wisdom and the contributions that he made to the progress of China's reforms. So this film will be liked by viewers. Deng's historic visit took place shortly after the normalization of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Today, it's looked back upon as a major milestone, demonstrating China's resolve to open up to the world and learn from the West. And for more on this movie and that very historical moment of U.S.-China relations, I'm joined here in the studio by Victor Gao Zhikai, our current affairs Thank commentator, you. who joined the foreign ministry a few years after Mr. Deng's 1979 trip. Welcome to our program. I know you Thank have you. been working as interpreter for Mr. Deng for quite some years during the 1980s. It's my great and honor, also yes. in Washington, D.C., we have uh, Mr. Philip Crowley, who is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State. Welcome as well, sir. Thank you. First of all, Mr. Gao, you Thank probably you. know better than Thank our you. American guest as to why this movie, once put into the theater, has aroused such a big response from the Chinese public. Just to remind our audience, this is not the first time that people got to know the stories behind the scenes about the China-U.S., how they established relations. It's not the first time that people got to know how historical figure Mr. Deng Xiaoping is. But why this specific documentary now? So much attention. Well, first of all, this movie is very unique. It's uh, very much of a documentary and lots of very unusual, extraordinary footages are being uh, appearing in this uh, movie. And also it used a lot of cartoon uh, footages. Mm -hmm. And uh, the visit in 1979 was truly historic because that normalized the relations between China and the United States and also changed the course of history in the world. And uh, I would say that people now watch this movie and reflect back in 1979 how much wisdom, vision and courage it took for China and the United States to achieve normalization of relations mm. with each other which eventually brought down the collapse of the so former Soviet Union and I think it reminds people today that we need to really steady the course of the development of China US relations to make sure that China and the United States remain right. friends rather than enemies with each other well, that's the lesson Things have changed, just to put it mildly, I would use the word dramatically, because today's China was not the China, let's just say, 40 years ago. Uh, today's United States, not anymore as it was, and also the world has changed. Mr. Crowley, how much really inspiration can we draw from the story more than 40 years ago about the vision, about the courage, about the efforts, as the words used by Mr. Gao in Beijing, when it comes to bilateral relations, Mr. Crowley? I think you're exactly right. It, the film reminds us of how far 
you know, the, and how transformative the relationship between the United States and China is. If you draw a, a very brief comparison, in 1979, months after you know, Deng Xiaoping's visit, you know, students in Tehran, Iran, overran the uh, U.S. embassy there, uh, you know, took hostages for a period of time. And when you reflect 36 years later, you know, U.S.-Iranian relations are basically still frozen in time. Mm. By contrast, U.S.-China you know, relations, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that it is the most important and influential bilateral relationship in the world today. Mm. You know, and the depth, the breadth, uh, and maturity that we see in the relationship you know, has been remarkable, if not meteoric, but over you know, these you know, three-plus decades. Well, Mr. Crowley, people would argue, well, bilateral relations these days, of course, let's just be frank here, is mainly for national interests plus the international environment, which, of course, eventually contributes to the national interest. So people wonder whether the fundamental national interests of the United States and China these days have changed or evolved that the story is back 40 years ago. Is this still going to be relevant today? What is your take of these kind of uh, thoughts? Oh, it, it's absolutely relevant today. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese economy and the United States economy are very significantly you know, interwoven. The financial and economic you know, fortunes of both countries uh, are, are basically inseparable, mm. you know, today. Uh, it is a complex relationship. There are always going to be, you know, tensions in the relationship because of differences in geography, politics, you know, uh, history. But nonetheless, I think what the countries have learned to do over these 36 years is to manage tensions that do exist. They existed back then. They exist today. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is a mature relationship, uh, and the, the uh, you know, the two countries have been able to identify core interests that benefit the people of both countries as well as the region and the world. Deng Xiaoping's visit also saw him interact with many ordinary American citizens. Take a look at this. 1979, when Deng Xiaoping was in Texas, Josie Sisters performed a rodeo show for the vice premier. And today, many Chinese people still remember the moment Deng put on a cowboy hat given to him by one of the sisters. And Deng also applauded John Denver at the Kennedy Center as he sung some of his greatest hits for the visiting leader. Of course, that's American country music. Later, Mr. Denver also performed in China. He was quite a hit in this country. Many would say this has a lot to do with the relations. Then, Mr. Crowley, I see a very sweet smile on your face. Because when it comes to really cultural exchanges, this is the softest part of our heart. And we could also tell the great people of the two countries really like each other. However, there's the question, whether politicians are smart enough, strong enough, and visionary enough to overcome some of the current little hurdles they have for their internal politics and be able to embrace the potential of the relations in the future. Mr. Crowley. Well, I think leaders from both countries have recognized the value of these kinds of exchanges at the leadership level, as we saw with you know, Deng Xiaoping, as well as at the you know, level of people to people. You know, the interaction between the Chinese people and the American people is now, you know, has been has been a, a dimension of the, you know, transformation of the relationship. And I do think that at the leadership level, you can have these exchanges, you know, that do um, help each other appreciate the unique history and culture. You know, I was part of a delegation in 1998 that came to China with President Clinton. I remember vividly, you know, being able to go to Xi'an and seeing the terracotta warriors, mm -hmm. being able to take a, a trip down the Li River, you know, in Guilin, you know, and, and see the, the beautiful Chinese countryside. You know, so I think these, these are the kinds of uh, visits and, mm -hmm. and events that do help us understand each other better. And I do think that that will be part of why the, I agree with my colleague that while there will always be tensions and bumps along mm -hmm. the road, you know, this, you know, the two countries have advanced very significantly, and I don't think there's any turning back. Well, the question is, when it comes to strategic interest, 
can the two countries be able to be smart enough to find enough common ground to work on, Mr. Well, Yao? First of this all, is really the fundamental question. Absolutely. First of all, I would say among the Chinese people, there is tremendous amount of goodwill and good feeling and friendship towards the American people. So that's not a problem at all. And I think this is the, really the foundation of China-U.S. friendship. On the other hand, I think uh, the Chinese people under the leadership of the Communist Party do not want to be bullied or lectured mm -hmm. by any country in the world, including the United States. So I think uh, the United States is also encouraged to China to deal with China as an equal, as a partner, as a friend, and do not create the suspicion in China that the United States is going out of its way to derail China's peaceful rise. Mm -hmm. I would say if China and the United States can at least agree on this bottom line, then we will be in a very comfortable position of mm. at least avoiding a total confrontation with each other. Because the, con the confrontation that some people worry about will not only be destructive of China and right. the United States, but also highly destructive of the whole world. In China though, Mr. Gao, a lot of people use the word words, but also Chinese believe even more in actions. And meanwhile, the Chinese always believe that when others look at the history of China and why China look at certain things, they might not necessarily understand the perspectives mm -hmm. uh, as to why China takes certain uh, stance uh, when it comes to territorial, political issues, and also other issues with, for example, China's neighbors. So the question is whether this communication can be done right whether this communication can be purely done without mixed up with other kinds of interests involved. Mr. Gao, is that being done? Can that be done? Well, between China and the United States today, we have thousands of different channels of communication. But what's lacking is really at the very, very top. We still need to establish a very reliable, very trustworthy, mm -hmm. very private in nature channel of communication between the top leader in China and the top leader in the United States mm. because this is a sure way to make sure that the two countries can really look into each other's eye and see the possibility of enhancing trust and confidence with each other and avoiding suspicion of right. each other and second guessing each other. This is truly a very, very unique opportunity for China and the United States to rewrite history so that both countries will be on the top tier of the world and both will deal with each other as partners with each other mm, okay. rather than you know, threaten each other and eventually destroy global peace and stability. Right. This is a chance we need to seize. This is the best moment for both China and the United right. States to demonstrate that they are truly world leaders for themselves, but also for the rest of the world. Finally, before we go, very briefly from you, Mr. Crowley, uh, September is the month that's really going to examine whether the leadership are really going to do their job in terms of building a great foundation for China-U.S. relations because Chinese President Xi Jinping is going to pay a state visit to the United States for the very first time. What do you think should be the mission of this trip for both sides? As long as they have done that, it can be regarded as a successful visit, can be regarded as a successful stage and transition of this bilateral relation, arguably the most important in the world. Well, I mean, picking up on, on the last comment, I, right. I think that there are these broad channels of communication. The leadership, they do know each other you know, very well. John Kerry, the Secretary of State, you know, was just in Beijing, had a brief meeting with the president, had a detailed meeting with State Counselor Yang. Mm. So I, I think that you do have this breadth of contacts on a regular basis. It's not just about managing crises. It's about a, and a constant interaction. I think we'll see that. You know, in the uh, in, in the upcoming visit of of President Xi, and, and right. that will remind us of the breadth and depth of the Chinese-U.S. relationship today.